All right, this is Art131 with Wyndham Graves, and today I have Cassandra Rangros here with me, and we're going to talk about food and food culture. Um, Cassandra, if you'd introduce yourself. Sure. I'm uh, Cassandra Rangros, and I have a background in food that starts with my education, formal education at the Culinary Institute of America, and subsequently trained in hospitality um, and business, and um, for a period of about three and a half, four years, um, my husband and I operated a restaurant here in a small town outside of Tallahassee. I live outside of Tallahassee. Um, I've lived here for about 10, 15 years, I guess. Time really flies. Yeah, it does. Um, and I'm really looking forward to this chat. All right. Awesome. And um, when you were at the CIA, uh, what, uh, what was your concentration? It was baking and pastry arts, and I, yep, the acronym is the CIA, so mm -hmm. don't get confused during this recording when you hear CIA referred to a lot. Yeah. <laughs> We're not talking about the Central Intelligence Agency. No, no. Culinary Institute of America, right? Correct. Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. um, and so when you have a concentration in that, in baking and pastry, as you said, uh, what... Is there anything in baking and pastry that that doesn't cover? Or is it just like literally anything we think of that's bread or dessert kind of pastries that's in there? That's a really good question. I think it really would cover what most people think of across the spectrum of anything that is baked, anything that is pastry, um, anything from rustic breads that are hearth fired all the way to refined, highly decorated um, cakes all the way to, you know, French vinoiserie, which is um, things like croissants and um, fine dining desserts for large production settings, such as catered events and restaurants, um, okay, chocolate cool. work, um, cook, you know, cookies, basic cakes, that kinds of thing. Yeah, that sounds like everything I can think of. Um, all right, awesome. Uh, so I kind of wanted to start this conversation um, a little closer to home and kind of in the way that, that food is part of culture. And I think that that's something that um, is starting to come back in the last maybe decade mm. and a half, uh, where it was dropped, where, where food was kind of going away from that and becoming a science. And um, people were looking at what their grandparents did and rejecting it as opposed to embracing it and i think nowadays people are coming back to mm -hmm. that and um mm -hmm. i just want to ask you does your professional training in any way change the way you act or participate in the kitchen with other people like when i'm cooking in the kitchen i have people around and everybody's kind of you know they're pitching in and helping um or just watching in some cases for those people that are not to be trusted um and does your professional <laughs> does, yeah does your professional education um change that dynamic or does it improve it or what what's the difference you know i think it's like anything that you do that you immerse yourself in and when mm -hmm. you completely immerse yourself in something it changes you in ways that you really probably can't perceive but there are probably some ways that you can perceive mm -hmm. um and you know, Wyndham, you and I have cooked in the kitchen a lot together. Yes. <laughs> and as you've mentioned, there are people who can be more participative in the process or who aren't participant in the process. Mm -hmm. I guess it depends on whether we're talking about, you know, cooking for myself or my husband or my family in a kind of more informal setting. Yeah, let's, or let's just say trying truly to orchestrate informal. something more. Yeah, yeah. Um, so if we're talking about the way that it changes the cooking process mm -hmm. for an informal kind of day-to-day -day setting. I think the skills really transform um, the process. It becomes more efficient and more um, discreet, less wandering, less exploratory, perhaps, in the day-to-day. -day. Hmm. Um, okay. Tasks kind of break down into their, for me, the, the chunks that kind of like, like I'll dice everything at once. I'll saute everything at once. I'll, I kind of think through the procedure in advance. Whereas I think a lot of people just kind of like move through a recipe and do everything kind of the way it's described in the method of a recipe. 
I think the biggest thing is really methods versus recipes. I don't follow recipes almost all of the time. I'm reviewing recipes to come up with something that I want to make or in the style of it. But, mm -hmm. but there's, I can't think of the last time I followed a recipe to the letter, but it's really about <laughs> kind of the method, the ingredients, the outcome that you're trying to achieve and um, breaking it up, up the whole meal in an efficient process. And yeah. I think that's because cooking school is about um, production mm -hmm. <laughs> and about outcome. Um, so efficiency of production is key. You can make the best food in the world, which nobody's going to do right out of color. If you did, if you couldn't do it quickly, you're going to be laughed out of the kitchen. Yeah, I can imagine. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, de I definitely feel like I'm always about uh, five minutes behind on when I need an ingredient to be ready to go into something if I'm actually following a recipe. <laughs> <laughs> um, That's interesting, yeah. Now, with that, um, do you do you like having other people there watching, or does it is that a bother or something? Because I know that, um, especially for art students in particular, I know that some of my kids, they, some of my kids, some of my college students, um, will some of your adults. cannot yeah, some of my adults, <laughs> um, cannot work with somebody watching. Um, is that something that you're okay mm. with, or does it depend on who it is, or is that just a complete no no and you have to have your back turned? Oh, oh my goodness. That's a great question. No, most of the time I say I invite people into the kitchen. I love it. I think what people experience um, who haven't been trained when they come into my kitchen or my space, unless there's somebody like you who has just an extremely high confidence level in general, yeah. <laughs> they're going to be very um, concerned about how they're perceived by me. Like, am I going to be judging the way that they cut an onion or am I going to make them feel incompetent about something that they think they know how to do. I feel like I perceive that a lot when people come into my kitchen, uh, but I love it. And I try to encourage people to like, let go of that. That's not what I'm here for. I'm here to cook with you and enjoy the process because we're supposed to be doing that. We're, that's, that's the point of us cooking together. Mm -hmm. It's not about perfection um, for me. Yeah. I think I you had... might be, uh, you might be misreading my complete knowledge of my ignorance as confidence or I'm just going in <laughs> without any knowledge at all and just <laughs> knowing you're judging me anyway <laughs> okay yeah I mean I'm of course I can't help but think okay like I of course I notice if somebody is cutting an onion in a way that's going to cut their finger off or makes me feel nervous because I feel like it's not safe or isn't efficient of course I notice I'm observant and I'm aware yeah. um but it's not that's not your job. Like that's not somebody who's untrained's job to know how to do that. So if somebody wants some instruction, sure, I'll kind of maybe try to offer it if it's especially if it's something dangerous. Yeah. But to your question about being watched, um, you know, most of the things that I cook around other people are things that I have a high degree of confidence I will be able to execute. Mm. So there's um, no experiment on those and so, days. It may be an experiment, but it's using the same skills and methods that I've applied many, many other times. So mm, okay. even if something were to go slightly wrong, I know how to correct it. I've done this a million times. It's just with this set of ingredients instead of that, or um, with this tweak of the method that I've practiced, you know, thousands of times. Mm -hmm. um, but what, one thing that is interesting that comes to mind with this question mm -hmm. is pie is pie. I went to school hmm. for baking and pastry arts, okay? Pie is not considered a very elevated pastry. <laughs> Those people are wrong. It's a pie crust. <laughs> they are wrong. I believe that they are wrong, but it's not considered something that's extremely technically challenging. Yeah. But for me, pie, it gets me every time. I, I feel that after spending significant time working on pie. I'm, I'm still not confident in it. Isn't that funny? Yeah. Um, I always feel like my pies shrink too much or their decoration kind of dissolves. And 
and I don't want people to watch me make pie. <laughs> I like to make pie in the dark at like midnight by myself while nobody's watching. Yep. If I could do that. Um, but what ends up happening is every Thanksgiving we make a ton of pies and somebody's always watching because that's how Thanksgiving is. Um, so that is an interesting scenario where it's something I'm not comfortable with and I don't like being watched. And I feel like I will not exaggerate. I feel like a failure when my pies don't turn out right, which oh. is feels to me me like most of the time I make pie. So even though, you know, I have the technical skills to, to make a very good pie, that something in my brain is tripping me up. And I think that that, I think that that um, is something a lot of people can experience uh, uh, or relate to across disciplines, I imagine. Oh, yeah. yeah, there's always that. Um, yeah. There's that one thing you're yeah, just real bad maybe at. Exactly. Yeah. And maybe for students too, you know, I'm no longer a student formally. Um, I think of myself as a student of food probably for the rest of my life because it's something I'm really devoted to, even though I don't do it full time. Well, I feel like um, it's one of those things that's really most... hard to be excellent at, too. Like, you can be good, but you can always be better. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Right. That's probably true for a lot of things. But food is unique in that it's unlike sculpture, you know, or unlike, I don't know. Um, I'm just going to make something up like underwater basket weaving. Most mm -hmm. people don't know about those things everybody has to experience food <laughs> yes whether it's good or bad um, there, you have some experience right yeah exactly um now did you grow up in a kitchen where you watched other people cook um, definitely um i i grew up as the oldest of many children i say many because the number kept growing as i became an adult <laughs> <laughs> um but i now have 10 siblings Jeez. and um my yeah um and so i was the oldest and um my mother grew up in rural appalachia um it's really not an exaggeration to say that my mother's family was primarily subsistence um farmers mm -hmm. and um so from that you know cooking is is a daily necessity in that mm -hmm. environment um, and she enjoyed cooking and uh, would be relatively experimental, I think, uh, for the, the time that would have been the early 90s where I first would have recalled my mother cooking mm -hmm. um, and, and, and was a good cook. Um, and it became something I was interested in. I liked doing things as a child. I liked making things. Mm -hmm. And pretty quickly, I demonstrated an interest in cooking. Um, I think it started off with something we called preacher cookies they're a cookie you don't bake because you make them when the preachers come in and you can see them out the front um in the front yard you can whip them up that quick by the time he's in the door oh. you've got cookies for your preacher That's hilarious. <laughs> i think that was the first thing i remember making um but the second thing was probably mac and cheese out the box mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> um but quickly that translated into as my mom ended up becoming a single mother um my response ability was to cook for myself and many many days if i had not prepared dinner they would not have eaten and so it really translate it transformed into something that was you know something i enjoyed doing and i had carried that with me even though it was something that became a, again a daily necessity yeah well it's good that, that even though it was a responsibility that it, it stayed something that was enjoyable to you because i know that for a lot of people as soon as something becomes required the joy of it kind of falls away. I feel so lucky in that regard. I don't know how my life would be. I, I really have a hard time imagining my life if that had happened. And I, I feel that very key. Yeah. Now, since we're um, kind of on that topic and we're talking about uh, subsistence, farm subsistence farming and things like that, <laughs> um, I think that an interesting thing that both you and I have a lot of interest in is... Um, global cuisines, um, some of the cultural issues around those, and the idea of uh, peasant food being essentially the best stuff in the world. Um, and mm -hmm. where would you like to start with that? Do you want to start with ethnic cuisines, or do we want to talk about the concept of peasant food? Because I think that that's one that might trip some people up, in that you're trained in all this fancy stuff, but like push comes to shove and you want a good meal, it's going to be simple oh that's so true let's talk about peasant food then let's dive into globalization ethnic cuisines and kind cool. of the cultural Works issues around that does that sound good yes okay 
So how would you define peasant food? Can I ask you that? Sure. Um, I would define it as a high staple grain mixed with a very small amount of medium quality protein. Okay. And then spices for a okay. region. Yeah, okay. So it's about um, um, accessibility, um, high nutrient absorption, mm -hmm. calorie dense. Yeah, very calorie um, dense. Pro yeah, probably somewhat easier to prepare. Um, I was sort of conflating it a little bit with street food, which I think is actually a different concept. Yes, um, I think street, street food is a different right? thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, and then the, we probably ought to define what high cuisine is. So yes. if peasant food is what people are eating on a daily basis, and it's probably driven by what they're growing in their region and the limited resources that unfortunately still most of the world has at their mm -hmm. disposal. Um, high cuisine is what most people in culinary school are trained on primarily. Now mm -hmm. at the CIA, there was a good amount of focus on ethnic and um, regional cuisines, as well as um, some of the more simple versions of kind of day-to-day -day food that mm -hmm. we've called peasant food. But high cuisine is um, really, maybe unfortunately, <laughs> hyper-focused on European cuisine, Western food, and developed in um, the courts of um, monarchies in Europe and became documented probably um, for the first time in the middle of the 18th century. Mm -hmm. A really good resource for envisioning how this kind of came to be um, is any uh, Jean Anthelm Briat Savaron, I can spell that later in the Discord. Um, okay, okay. His writings, which documented court life and food, um, and even includes the what we could consider like the invention of the salad in the modern context, which is kind of a mind blowing thing that That's... salad had to be invented. Yeah, well, it's just funny that one guy <laughs> wrote it down and now it exists. Right. Um, and he wasn't a cook. He was what's called a gourmand, which a gourmet and a gourmand. A gourmand is somebody who really enjoys the physical experience of eating food. Um, That's a cool word. And particularly, yes, so I like it a like little a bit more than eater. gourmet. Yes. <laughs> I would definitely see myself as a gourmand. And sometimes I have to, you know, be careful about that. Um, yes. But yeah, high cuisine was food for the wealthy and, and included not only just the wealthy, but the very privileged ruling class. Um, so most of what we think of as fine dining food, um, food that's expensive, where you're spending $100 for a meal for one person where you're having multiple courses and there's white tablecloths. Many people in America don't ever get that experience. Mm -hmm. um, but that evolves from high cuisine. So to contrast that with, with peasant food, you know, you're talking about tons of fats and um, ugh, difficult to grow vegetables. Maybe even now we talk about it in terms of out of season or hard to get things. Yeah. Um, and of course, it's now just with completely the opposite of what people eat get, every yeah. day. Right, right. <laughs> and sometimes the point of it was to be absurd. Um, maybe your students have seen or heard of people putting gold leaf on food. Yeah. What's the point of that? <laughs> to make it expensive and fancy. It's to, exactly, and to bring class into the equation um, to a pretty high degree. So... You well, know, like peasant the... food is about accessibility and feeding people, and high cuisine is about an experience of food that's exclusive. What was it for high cuisine? Was it a pineapple that people used in art all the time that was like the equivalent of like fifteen to twenty thousand dollars to get to get one into Northern Europe? Um, oh it... my goodness! Yeah, you know, I don't know about that specific example. Oh, um, yeah. So pineapples, I forget exactly the the dollar val value, but somebody did a study of of how much it would have cost to get one into some of these courts, and they actually found records of people <laughs> renting, essentially time sharing a pineapple. So you didn't eat it; <laughs> it was just on the table because it showed that you had enough money to get it from like somewhere, yeah, uh, into Northern right. Europe. And yeah, if you look it up, so there's really crazy stuff. Food as symbolism. Like yes, yeah, right, definitely. Right. And so Versus high cuisine. food as nutrition. Yes, definitely not nutrition. Um, high high cuisine, kind of what most people would think about when they think about that in the United States, is specifically French, right? Yes. 
Okay, so that's the the Correct. lots of fancy birds instead of chickens. Um, very complicated <laughs> ways to do things. A lot of butter. Right. <laughs> Um, a lot of butter, which is a very prized fat, um, and a lot of concentrated boilings of meat <laughs> stock. Well, um, to extract maximum stock, flavor. Right? Yeah, yeah um, stock. Um, but then again, most of the French sauces are reduced versions of stock. So a, a good example is demi-glace. This is not something that's very practical to make if you're hungry. No. Um, it takes... 16 hours to make and you take stock and reduce it i think something like eight or ten times and oh um kind of incorporate a fond of brown it's what you think of as brown sauce but most of it isn't made the proper way no. um and it's, it ends up being this incredibly savory amazing um thick brown sauce um <laughs> demi -gloss. Um, but it's not it's not practical for people who need to put food on the table you yeah, know of course not. every day um, is there any other de like definitional edges that we should call with uh, like fine dining cuisine? Is there anything in the actual ingredients? Not, of course, the presentation is something entirely different, but uh, in the That's ingredients. That's true. I mean, spices are kind of used high or low cuisine. Right, and it depends on where you are. You know, in in Europe, peasant food wouldn't have had spices. Oh. if we think of pre-industrial area uh, era um but that's not at all true in in asia <laughs> yeah, very true. um uh it you know it's just that like you said for the pineapple is the cost of getting the spices to europe yeah um definitely no i think that's good the the um em emphasis on grain in peasant food is probably important um because it's a f it's a filling you know uh, substance where in Asia, of course, it's rice, and much of the Middle East, it's also rice. Most of the world, it's actually rice. <laughs> yeah. Europe is really the only place where you see um, uh, wheat being used as the primary uh, foodstuffs. Yeah. And then in Africa, a good portion of Western Africa relied on what we, um, well, what the, the word is yam, but maybe not what you think of um, when you hear the word yam. As yeah. this, another starchy substance in starchy South America, vegetables. a lot of, yeah, yeah um, potato in South America and uh, yucca in the, um, in the Pacific. So all about starchy products, whether it's a grain or, or a root vegetable. Yeah. And um, I think another thing that, that one of the other things that I said that I think you agreed with, but I'm not sure. Um, was the quality of protein, I think, is something that really changes with peasant food that isn't in, like, high dining, like I said, it, it's not chicken. Like, for French food, if you get something fancy, it's <laughs> duck or pheasant or something silly. Uh, it's not chicken. Um, <laughs> but when we think about... Yeah, the quality, the nature of the protein, and, and not only the animal, but where on the animal the food comes from, where, where the cut comes from. Um, in peasant food, you see a lot more, if you see meat eating at all, which is not a given, um, you yes, see, uh, you know, or organ meats, the entire animal being, and in fine cuisine, although liver and um, certain fatty um, organs are prized, like uh, the thymus glands, um, you don't see as much consumption of brain mm -hmm. or lung tissue heart in fine cuisine whereas you would see that amongst people every day mm -hmm. um and just to put it in perspective you know i knew this but it didn't hit home until i tried to buy half a cow <laughs> <laughs> a few years ago and i ended up not buying the half a cow but i really researched it and half a cow was something like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pounds of stew meat and ground beef and mm -hmm. and something like 16 ounces of filet mignon. Yeah, <laughs> an entire half of uh, what we consider so, a car-sized animal. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And it yields a pound or two, you know, of 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 highly prized steak meat. Now, of course, that's a real exaggeration, but it just really illustrates the the scarcity of tender cuts of meat which well and that's are the um a, a the phrase of eating high them. on the hog is literally just the top half of the hog was more prized as the meat right 
than things like pork belly and things yeah, like that. Yeah, because were, it's uh, right. less yeah, yeah, it's all about the locomotion of the animal where you see muscles being used more um, daily. You have tougher cuts of meat. And where the muscle gets to ride, then you have back strap mm -hmm. um, and tenderloin, which is basically the same thing, and all the um, hanger steaks, things like that. Yeah, that are all the fancy, difficult to get to. and uh, Yeah, and <laughs> so... I think one thing so so peasant food is kind of this thing that we've defined as a as a starch plus possibly some kind of protein if you're lucky uh spices if you're in the right place if you're in the right places and i think that um people kind of see it as an other because they are so mm. different place to place but um mm -hmm. i just find it amazing how many cultures have a chicken and rice dish Oh yeah, that's a good one. Poultry is so easy to to um, to grow. I'm, yeah, I'm to struggling raise, for the yeah. right word here. <laughs> to raise, to replicate, <laughs> um, it has very few needs that you can't meet for it by just having a nice patch of, of grass. Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, rice. I already mentioned most of the world eats rice. So if you think about, I mean, you can get to the ubiquity of a lot of things that way everybody has rice everybody's chicken they're gonna find a way to put them together mm -hmm. yeah and the difference between it's sort like... of like everybody has a grain yeah go ahead i was gonna say um like i was just thinking about the difference between like a a southern uh u.s ch uh, flavored chicken and rice compared to like a plow which are exactly the same things with just different spices shoved in and different fats Right. And even a lot of times they have the same words, which I find fascinating. Um, yeah. Pilo, perlo, pilau uh, are used across the globe. And I think that's actually a really good transition into the early globalization of food. Cool. Perfect. This is Do something that. I've come to appreciate. Okay. Um, so we think of, I think most of us think of global food as a recent phenomenon. Like, um, for example, my mother's family in rural Appalachia didn't have pizza until the 90s. <laughs> <laughs> um, and like Chinese food, much more recent than that. Mexican food was completely like, I just think it was out of the realm of like the idea of what they could eat. Italian food was exotic. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. um, so, you know, if you use that kind of microcosm as an, I, I do believe that cities are more global and they have been for a while, but I think most of us think of the modern era, post-industrial era, as the time at which of, of which our food became more um, accessible to cultures that we aren't a part of, mm -hmm. like when Mexican restaurants start open up on every corner, etc. Mm -hmm. um, but over time, I've really learned, and I think it might be interesting for your students to know that globalization is inc incredibly early in our food history. Yeah. The first example most people would be able to think of when, if they're asked to kind of you know, wonder about something where you think it's one thing, but it's actually another is the tomato. Yeah. Um, and many people know this. The tomato is not Italian, right? The tomato is a new world. Mm -hmm. uh, it was foreign to Europe before it was introduced after, after uh, colonization, after the colonial period. And yet now it's like basically the symbol of Italy in so many ways yep. right um and what most of us associate with italian food is heavily tomato based although they might disagree with that yes. <laughs> as, a, as americans if we could distill it into one thing we'd be like ah tomatoes tomatoes yeah we we can just assume but, um, that we can do this from the american perspective because i think that's gonna be most of our listeners yes exactly um you know potatoes uh irish potato famine yep. i think most of us think potatoes were irish nope they were in south america yep <laughs> remote remote south america yeah. yet they made it over to europe so early that we can kind of forget about all that when we think about um modern history yeah. um the chili pepper the chili pepper is prized in so much um asian and and indian cuisine but it's mm -hmm. native to the new world there's not a single pepper species that grows in Asia naturally. 
Um, of course, now they do, but the spiciness of food was was preferred in Asia, um, especially in regions like Sichuan, China, and so peppercorns to get their spice. So when they discovered mm -hmm. um, through global trade, the early global trade, this pepper, of course, now it's ubiquitous in in so many um, Chinese dishes. Mm -hmm. um, as an example, I remember that one particularly blowing my mind. I was like, really? <laughs> yeah. The fact that all like um, Southeastern a a Asian food is so heavily based on peppers that did not exist there. Um, exactly. Yes. Yeah. So we've been globalized and our food has influenced each other for so long. It's yeah. almost like we really like tasting new things. <laughs> yeah. Um, Human beings and like applying novelty. them to what we know, right? So that kind of goes back to your chicken and rice dish comment mm -hmm. that, um, you know, it, adding this or that here or there makes a little bit of a variation on something that's very familiar, very comforting to us, mm -hmm. um, yet adds a new taste, which I think we must crave since we pulled all this food from all over so early in our um, modern history that we can't really remember a time where it wasn't a thing. <laughs> Yeah, and I think that even nowadays, most people will choose different restaurants over the same ones or different kinds of cuisines over the same ones just to, to try it, just to see what's different and new in the world. I think we have that as an mm -hmm. innate thing. When somebody offers you something new, most people will give it one shot at least. I think that's a good idea for humanity's perspective, right? Ev evolution depends on us finding new things to eat yep. um, because you're constantly moving, having to try new stuff. Yeah, that's a really good point that, that the, the people who were unwilling to try new things probably didn't make it too far or just kept getting <laughs> right, hungry until right. they did try it. <laughs> <laughs> Hunger does a lot for that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's a lot of things I think about of like, how did somebody figure out that an oyster had an, had meat inside of it? Like, that had to take a lot of effort to figure that one out. It's fascinating. The world is fascinating. You have to open that oyster, and then you have to look at that and decide, I'm going to eat that. Well, it's I know it's like, tasty. On the bottom of the ocean. <laughs> it doesn't look that way. No, it looks awful. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, for the globalization of food and um, I, one, one thing I wanted to comment on just because I think it's funny is the um, uh, masala, the Indian dish is just a, a, a messed up ver ver version of marsala, the French term. Uh, and just like little stuff like that is <laughs> you know, just I didn't so know that. Me. Oh yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a, oh, yeah. when yeah. the British came over, they said, hey, make this dish. And so it got made with all the local ingredients and they mispronounced the word and they kept the mispronunciation. <laughs> yeah, that's, a, that, that's one that's of my amazing. favorites. Um, right, and the number one dish of, of Great Britain over and over again is chicken tiki masala. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so that's just yeah. amazing. And one thing that I think is interesting also is when we talk about the globalization of food, um, also the modernization of food. Um, how mm -hmm. specifically Brit British food? Everybody jokes that the that the favorite dish of Britain is is is, is tikka masala, um, and everybody gets on the British for having just terrible food. And historically, all of British food would have been roasted. All British meats would have been roasted. Mm -hmm. A lot of the vegetables would have been roasted. And when you switch to the modern method of cooking, especially with coal, you can't do it directly over a flame because it would taste just god awful. Mm -hmm. um, and so when you move every single of the, one of these recipes that's essentially supposed to be smoked or grilled or, or, or flame charred to being boiled or pan seared at best, that just destroys Ugh. a cuisine. <laughs> Yeah. That just ruins it. <laughs> yeah. And right, right. And it's funny how easily it, some of it, the... Sorry, go. <laughs> no, I, I'm sorry. Um, no, I'm just so feeling that, and I'm wondering how prevalent that is. And, you know, poor British food, because they have simple ingredients, I think they get the brunt of it. But most of us have seriously suffered. <laughs> yeah, I from think modern, a loss yeah. of quality of food production in modern times. Just how boring something like pork is versus like the number of 
pork-based creatures in the world. <laughs> yeah, um, and how many of your students have suffered eating a dry pork chop, you know, dinner that they just dreaded, you know? <laughs> I think that, like, every person in this country has eaten a dry pork chop. That is sad. Yes. <laughs> just the way the world works. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, is there anything else on... on now, how do you feel about cultural sensitivity and, and food culture? Because I'm kind of one of those people where I will totally just take whatever recipe that I want, whatever food culture that I want, and do whatever I want with it because it's in my house and that's kind of what I want to make that night. Um, <laughs> sure. Yeah, there's a lot more we could talk about on modernization too, um, but I definitely yeah. think it's important to touch on the ethnic cuisines and kind of cultural sensitivity issues. I'm like that too, Wendy. You, you know this. Yeah. Um, my favorite thing to make is something I've never made before. Mm -hmm. um, and people ask me, what's your favorite thing to make? Uh, something new. And it kind of took me a while to realize that. But And that has mostly shown up in trying food I've never had before, or it probably won't ever, or at least especially not now, travel to go get <laughs> yes. um, from somewhere I, I'm not likely to be able to visit much or at all or in the near future. I don't want to wait till I'm like 80 and hopefully retired to like try Vietnamese food for the first time. Yes. Um, <laughs> so much of my cooking uh, is is of, cu of cuisines, of cultures that I am not a part of, right? Yeah. Um, and over time I've become more aware of applying the cultural um, sensitivity kind of to that as we do other um, other areas like we we talk about appropriation and do we want to accidentally and insensitively mis misappropriate something that doesn't belong to us and I think that applies to food mm -hmm. just as much as anything else mm -hmm. um, visual symbolism music whatever it is so but I don't think that should especially considering that we have just talked about how much our cuisines have been globalized forever basically as long as cuisine has been an idea um that we shouldn't shy away from trying things that don't belong to us um but seeking information that is good and from the culture i think is important and then of course not pretending ownership of it like i can make um rice and a, a house fish sauce and a cabbage and um a you know some grilled chicken and toss it together and i have something in the vietnamese style but it's not vietnamese because i didn't i'm not vietnamese i don't really know what that's supposed to take like i've never been to vietnam i oh. used my knowledge my growing body of knowledge about vietnamese food and i'm just using that because that's that's what i'm currently doing <laughs> um, to apply apply the knowledge of ingredients and styles and cooking methods to my dinner tonight, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I'm not going to go open a Vietnamese restaurant with that. That's not my place or, um, you know, so do you, not going so to where say do you I, I've mastered as, Vietnamese cuisine. So where do you see it as, as maybe not being appropriate? Like where, where would you um, draw the line for where you start to feel uncomfortable, I should say? Is it is it claiming that this is Vietnamese food yeah. and then going and opening a restaurant or is, or what is it? <laughs> you know what comes to mind is like Chipotle and Moe's <laughs> and Panda Express. Um, oh, so like know, the absolute all... violations. Yeah, uh, there. I mean, and I don't want to pass judgment on those either, but at the same time, I I know that they were opened by white people and they're not white people's cuisine and it makes me feel a little weird um no but it, it, in my it... personal experience i don't really have any personal boundaries around that so long as i'm careful to to seek out true information of it like not um you know am i looking at somebody who lived in vietnam writing a, a cookbook somebody who has vietnamese heritage or am i like reading a uh, article from the New York Times written by a white person that's their interpretation of Vietnamese food to learn yeah. my techniques and yeah, I think that's that's really interesting um, one of my favorite things is is old 70s French cookbooks that have some sort of ethnic dish <laughs> in them that's just horrifyingly wrong um, 
Oh, that's a great point. Yeah. I, I, there's so many examples of that. Um, hey, and my, my grandma, you know, she's well-intentioned and she makes what she calls Italian sauce or <laughs> pasta. And it has no garlic. It has no oregano. It has nothing, but it's her version of spaghetti. And <laughs> it oh. just makes, that's kind of what makes me think of it. It's like, you know, she doesn't realize that she's not making Italian food. So if yeah. I'm not making a good facsimile of Vietnamese food, I'd rather, I want to know about it. So I'm not fooling myself. <laughs> yeah. But then In there's the context. things that's like, are you changing it because you're changing it to just the taste that you like? Are you changing it because of the taste of the people around mm. you? Are you changing it? And this is actually mm -hmm. a really interesting one that I've come up against is I've found old recipes that have ingredients that are incorrect simply because the real ingredient wasn't available. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That that plow recipe that I make a lot that that was my grandma's. Um, she grew up in India, uh, British British India, um, and grew up in India. And on her recipe, it calls for cottage cheese, which. Mm is insane because cottage cheese really wasn't an ingredient in that and i've never seen it an ingredient in that in any other recipe and it took mm -hmm. me until maybe two or three years ago to realize that that was supposed to be paneer and oh yeah it was just that yeah. in the early 60s in the united states you can't get paneer at the store right yeah and Unless so you know cottage how to make cheese it, which by the way was... it takes five minutes and it's so easy I know, but <laughs> but for a for a mom of four kids, that wasn't going to happen. No, so cottage oh, cheese was it. close enough. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But now, because I grew up eating it with cottage cheese, I have to have it with cottage cheese. I can't do it with paneer. It doesn't taste right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that gets into yeah, that gets into you know your your version of pilau the way that. I might be saying it wrong, um, that you grew up eating yeah, it actually didn't have an authentic ingredient in it. And, and so now if you make it more authentic to the ingredients available, um, when your, you know, grandmother was probably eating it in India, it doesn't taste authentic to you. Yep. Right. Yeah. And that, that's an interesting dynamic too. And now how do you feel about that? Like the, the nostalgia versus correct, um, or even just mm. not even nostalgia, but just like, this is just the way that I like it versus the quote-unquote correct re 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 recipe. Um, are those two things different? Yeah. Do you think that originality is different than personal taste? Or do they kind of both get the same value versus um, the rules? Mm -hmm. First of all, who makes the rules? <laughs> I don't know, some guy who's got what a, rules who's... are we talking about? Well, I think that yeah. and this might come from being in academia is that there's a certain inherent trust of people who have the piece mm -hmm. of paper that says they know what they're talking about. Um, mm -hmm, especially, mm -hmm. I think this is probably goes back to, you know, uh, the enlightenment and science being a thing. But when somebody figures it out and says, this is the way to do it because I've done it, you know, a hundred times and this is the best way, you have a certain amount of faith in that. Um, right. And so I think that that's where yeah. I give recipes credit is that I assume that they've done all mm -hmm. that work and they have all those skills. <laughs> yeah, that's a good, that's a very heavy assumption. Yeah. Um, so let's talk first about kind of nostalgia versus correctness. So, and let's define correctness for the purposes of this conversation as the way that we were taught in culinary school, whatever that is, okay. <laughs> that, that works. Um, to go to that academic kind of structure. So nostalgia is my grandma, um, and this actually just came up this week. Somebody that's never baked before successfully in her life sent me pictures of bread that she had baked, pandemic bread, right? Everybody's baking yeah. bread. And it was her um, significant other mother's recipe. And it, and it looked lovely. And I was so proud of her, and I still am. Even though the recipe she used called for Crisco. That's fine. Um, and Crisco is a, you know, manufactured sol uh, uh, saturated fat um, mm -hmm. that's usually white, although it can be colored yellow. And it was used pretty extensively in the post-industrial phase as a substitute for more natural fats. And it was marketed as healthier. It's totally not 
Um, yeah. But a lot of recipes from the 40s and 50s have it. And so when she went to make this recipe, she used it because she wanted to be authentic to the recipe. Now, if my grandma gave me a recipe that called for Crisco, I wouldn't use Crisco. I, can't, I detest it as, as a product because of what the havoc it has wreaked on health. Um, the fact that it is a byproduct, it's something I can't tolerate in my kitchen. I won't use it. It also tastes weird. So it's funny because it does taste weird, but if you have a taste for it, that kind of gets back to your taste question. That's true. Um, it tasted right to her significant other. And if I had made it with butter, which really is probably how it was made before it got translated into a recipe with Crisco. So like grandma made it into a recipe with Crisco because she had that ingredient. Mm hmm but probably her mom made it with butter. So which one is more authentic yeah. to to her SO, her significant other, the Crisco version is more authentic, but to his mom who made it, it was probably butter <laughs> that would have been more authentic. So, um, you know, there isn't really a right answer, um, but I do think that's interesting, that nostalgia versus correctness. So like we at culinary school never would have used Crisco at no. the Culinary Institute of America. Very few, okay, actually, we used it to make what we called sweet grease, which was um, icing that was specifically for decorating cakes only, for practicing um, our piping techniques, and we would throw it away. Oh, so not, not for human consumption, literally just aesthetic. Correct. That's gross. Yes. <laughs> and we would use it for, um, I'm remembering some kind of lubrication that we would do with it, but nothing Ew. edible. <laughs> oh, God. Oh yeah, you'd you'd use it to wipe down um, the surface when you're rolling out certain kinds of de decorative icings. Ew. Yeah, oh, but never God. for food. That's awful. <laughs> Sorry. That's awful. Now, so Crisco, so, do you replace that with butter? So, like, say somebody at home is making a recipe. They've always made it with with Crisco, but it's their grandma's recipe, and they have the same worry that you just did. That you know, their great grandma may mm -hmm. have been doing it with something that wasn't Crisco. Is that replacement butter or is it lard or, or tallow? Oh yeah, that's a good question. So it it's hard to know. You might be able to guess by some other recipes your grandma might have passed down. Like does she typically use ham hocks and cook with ham? Then it might've just been lard. Um, it, was it a dairy rich region? If so, it was probably butter. Oh, that's um, a good idea. <laughs> You gotta yeah, do some um, so I, I shouldn't have said that butter would have been like the assumption that was, I'm glad that you brought up the lard component because people used to cook a lot more with animal fats um, and that became out of favor with, um, I, you know, what's since been found to be unfounded uh, yeah. claims that it was unhealthy. Um, so it could have been lard, it could have been chicken fat. Um, a lot of baking in Jewish households is done with chicken fat, which is interesting. Yeah, and chicken fat, what's the word for chicken fat again? It's uh um in in Yiddish it's schmaltz. I think there's other names for it, but they're okay. not coming. I, I think that, that that's the word that I that I've heard. And just for everybody out there, um, lard is referring to pork fat rendered down, um, and tallow is referring to beef fat uh, rendered down. Um, are there any other animals that have like that specific word for just their fat component that, that you know of? <laughs> Mm. No, you know, I'm mostly I'm thinking about my big vat of goose fat in my in my fridge. I think it's yeah. just goose fat. I have one of those too. <laughs> but I, I'm not really an expert on that. So we're talking a lot about savory food, and you did mention you pointed out at the beginning that my my primary training is in baking and pastry arts. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting because so like most of my expertise is probably in the realm of baking. That's where I could probably claim expertise. Mm -hmm. Uh, but at the same time, I don't bake every day and I absolutely cook almost every day. <laughs> so there's more, uh... I think you apply the same kind of framework to learning about savory food. Yeah. That's cool. Um, yeah. And I think it's important to note that, that you said you have a, probably a big Tupperware of, um, goose fat in your fridge or freezer right, right now. And that's something that I've taken to doing as well yeah, as when I, I get a mason jar. Yep, when I get a big chunk of meat from anywhere and we're cutting it down for, for cooking, I've now started to uh, take all the fat before it gets brined or cooked or whatever happens to it and render that down and keep it in little Tupperwares uh, because it does just make so much yes. so much of a difference in some recipes. And for people who don't have a lot of resources, throwing away fat is, if you eat meat, 
and you're you're interested in trying to use product from animals um, and saving money. <laughs> Using animal fat is a huge money saver. I mean, oil is one of the most expensive cooking ingredients and you have to use it almost every time you cook. But if mm. you save the bacon fat every time you make bacon or if you <sighs> take off the chicken fat before you sear chicken breast and cook it down, um, I just did a turkey breast because it was on sale at Publix and the amount of fat on that turkey, it was like two or three cups just from the mm -hmm. breast, <laughs> the whole yeah. the whole breast with the bones. Um, and I, I'm pretty sure, I mean, if you think of two cups of oil that you buy at the grocery store, that's five bucks. I mean, that's not, yeah. that's not insignificant at all. So um, resource, uh, you can save a lot of resources. I was thinking about that as I, I watched my husband throw away just a tiny bit of chicken fat the other day, and I'm like, not in the time of pandemic. Don't throw that away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it can impart such um, incredible flavor to things that, that something like even good olive oil just doesn't really have what, and it's probably just because human beings are really built to want animal fat, uh, but it just doesn't impart the same flavor that tallow or, or, or lard does. You know, I'm going to respectfully disagree. I think really? a lot of plant fat do. I, I think a lot of plant fats can impart amazing um, flavor, um, especially olive oil. If you think about that one in particular, it just has a very specific um, flavor to it. And of course, so do all animal fats. Um, but I'm not going to disagree that I prefer animal fat. <laughs> um, and I have a specific taste. So what is it about olive oil you think that makes that so desired over everything else? Mm. Most vegetable oil today is made from plants that are not very fatty. Mm -hmm. um, they're more like grains and they turn out not to be very good for you. They're not really an oily substance to begin with, but they are heavily processed to extract the fat. And so it's a very neutral fat, like corn. You don't think about corn as a fatty vegetable. No. Um, but if you think about olives, think about how they taste and feel in your mouth um, with an avocado. Same thing. They're mm -hmm. incredibly fatty, unusually fatty um, vegetables. And when you extract their oil, because there's so much of it, a lot of the flavor of the plant comes through as well. It also takes hardly anything to extract the oil. I mean, olive oil is one of the first plant fats that we used um, because... Mm -hmm you can literally smash it with your body and <laughs> make yeah. oil, Get oil out um, of with just a little bit of processing. So um, I think that's what make olive oil in particular very, a very nice one. But I wouldn't praise most plant fats that are modern um, because of the reason I just described. So the ones their, you like their... are olive oil and avocado? Um, yeah, maybe nut oils like walnut oil, um, cashew, sesame oil is prized, um, yes. and toasted sesame oil is exceptional. Okay, so the, before we move off of um, nostalgia and the better, more correct recipes, uh, what are your personal all-the-time favorites, and what are your personal like special occasion favorite foods? Or favorite things to make, I should say, not foods. Well, I did mention that my favorite thing to make is something I've never made before. Yes, um, the fact that I don't cook from recipes means that I get a lot of freedom to play around and improvise. But, you know, everybody has their favorites, and my favorites are biscuits. <laughs> yep, okay. <laughs> I've had those before. <laughs> um, it's something I grew up eating, right? And if I eat a biscuit, I just feel happy and at home. Um, I kind of also really like pancakes. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm sensing a trend. <laughs> <laughs> breakfast. Yes. I love breakfast. I do love yeah. breakfast. And uh, yeah. then your special But I actually have to thing. say I don't make that very often. Um, you don't make no, pancakes very often? Other stuff. Well, these items that are my favorites, I don't make them very often, even though they're probably some of my favorite foods. Oh no. And then, so what's your well, like? I, I, like I said, I like other things. So what's your thing you do like once a year, or maybe maybe once every few years when you're just feeling exceedingly fancy? Mm. Goose. Goose, yeah. I, yes, I've come to start making goose every holiday season, um, 
It's a lovely meat. It's truly flavorful. It produ one goose produces two quarts of fat, which I then get to use for the rest of the year until I make a goose again. Mm -hmm. um, it's so rich and flavorful. It's almost like steak, <laughs> but yeah. it's a bird. It's amazing. So that's one. And then for um, breads, I really love making extremely fatty, delicious breads, like the best brioche you've ever tasted or cinnamon rolls or... Um, um, Day of the Dead bread or Pascal de Colomba, which is another one of these things where it's the bread is brought to its uh, literal physical extremes in terms of how much it can contain. It can contain no more fat than you put in. <laughs> and, okay. and to that end, it is delicious, delicious. Okay. And it comes in any number of forms, like I've mentioned before. I'm going to have to give that one a shot. Um, okay. <laughs> So let's move on to um, just a little bit of the professional end of this stuff. I don't want to spend too much time on it because, again, I think most people are interested in a little bit more interested in cooking and cuisine and baking and things like that because they now all of a sudden have the time and effort to do that. Whereas if you're working outside the home for, you know, 40 to 60 hours to 80 hours a week, most people don't want to come home and cook, uh, but now that they have a little bit more time, they might be getting back into it. But I do want to touch on a few of the pro stuff. Um, first off, what are the cuisines uh, and dishes that you would consider pro-level stuff that are just not really worth doing unless you have, you know, five cooks in the kitchen and a professional kitchen? <laughs> What's the pro stuff? What's the, the uh, do not attempt stuff. at home warning? Oh, that I really have a hard time telling people not to try things. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think if something catches your attention and you feel like you have the ingredients and the wherewithal to give it a go, you may as well. Um, but that being said, restaurants have ingredients that we often don't have at our disposal mm -hmm. um, at the home. Um, and, you know, honestly, the first thing that comes to mind is really good steak. Really? I just think an aged steak, most people aren't going to be tempted to try aging their own steak at home, nor will they have the equipment kind of necessary for that. Uh, yeah. Um, and then the cuts that are the best steaks, they don't go to your grocery store. They go to restaurants. They go to Shula's. They go to, um, I don't know, name the other big chains. Um but they're not going to you or you're not going to be able to access them. Yeah. Um, now that you might be able to find a way to do it. And if so, awesome. But I don't make steak that often because most of the time I'm pretty disappointed with it compared to what I could get at a restaurant. Yeah. Uh, any, any others that are just silly? Like, for example, I refuse to try that uh, foldy pastry type stuff. I just won't do it. <laughs> You know, that is hard. And what he's referring to, when when you're talking about that, you're talking about Vinoiserie. And that is like Vinoiserie is in Vienna. Osiri. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's a style of bread that's made by layering dough and fat together multiple times through a series of folds. And then sometimes leavening it with yeast to make things like croissants and Danish. Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, I don't make that at home. I don't get it but you can't get it either like where we live i live in tallahassee and there's not a there's not a producer here that can make it at the quality i would like to purchase it for yeah um so i just don't eat it either <laughs> but right. if i wanted to eat it i'd probably make it you know yeah. um but that's you know i am trained in that i spent hours days weeks practicing it i've cried over it you know <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, not exaggerating um and that would be hard to try at home but if somebody really wanted to try it man go for it like learn about it and Wyndham you're the, exactly the kind of person who wouldn't do that you know <laughs> you don't you're, you're not gonna see it as worth the squeeze yeah, um but yeah. some people might so yeah that's <clears throat> I'm barely on on that bread is worth the effort but it definitely is <laughs> Uh, right. Some of the more absurd But I things. wonder if what you're maybe talking about a little bit, 
yeah, is kind of like the experience of eating at a restaurant. And what you can't really replicate at home is that experience of getting multiple different courses where the chef has thought through every little detail and has paired everything perfectly together. Um, that's a fun thing to try to do at home, but oftentimes it's something that is worth paying for and going out and having the experience, even yes. if you can only do it once a year. Yeah, and I'd like to I'd like to touch on that a little bit more heavily in a minute. Um, one thing that we've actually found, and this okay. this just kind of goes home, or goes out to those people who maybe don't feel comfortable making a full like five course meal themselves, is that when we get together with people, we do courses. Um, we just split it up. We have a theme, and we split it up, and everybody makes a course. And then, so if you're with four or five other groups of people, then four out of the five courses you're eating that night are things you did not prepare and are not, you know. Are, are complete surprises to you and that's just been incredibly cool as a as a method of getting that sort of feeling but with home cooked so mm. when we're allowed yeah, to have dinner too, parties it's not again too overwhelming for it i'm sorry right sorry. <laughs> um that's a really great way of spreading the work around mm -hmm. and making it more accessible um even if you're maybe your friend group isn't maybe they're interested in learning to cook but they're not super um skilled yet that's a great way to build skill together well it's a good way to build skill and also it's a good way to at least what we found is it's a good way to kind of give people the option of picking a harder or easier task um so if they don't feel comfortable mm -hmm. with the more complex super difficult like pastry and stuff like that um they can just pick something mm -hmm. they, they, they can just do a, a main course stew and that's totally cool and fine and that's what everybody wants anyway so it works great <laughs> um yeah so young folks out there so, who haven't done dinner parties that's a good way to start it anyway can we revisit saying? the pro food versus um dishes you'd make at home i for, i kind of just remembered something that i don't think most people are familiar with but it's worth mentioning mm -hmm. Um, so modern cuisine, don't try that at home. <laughs> oh, yeah, no. And modern cuisine is um, usually kind of like highly chemical or highly um, momentary like yeah. process where um, and if you want more information about it, it's interesting. It's kind of pushing food in a different direction. But um, your Ferran Adria of Spain is... Yep. Um, maybe the first person that comes to mind when you think about modern cuisine he's of and it's El food Bui, that's right? not really yeah El Bui. he's yeah. not very it's not like very recognizable as food to most people maybe it looks a lot more like um, fine like, it might art, component. like visual art it does it looks yeah. yeah it's very abstract it's actually kind of an abstractization of food mm -hmm. um t boiling it down into its essential parts and i'm using the term boil completely not literally yeah. <laughs> <laughs> using a variety of techniques i mean you might even get um a, a, a glass jar atop of an aroma and that's one of your corsets there's no food yeah that, that, Don't try it's that. one of those things that people kind of make <laughs> fun of to some extent uh yeah mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I would definitely not try that at home. Um, I, as a person who likes that sort of stuff, have tried a few of them, and it's just, for the most part, not worth the effort. Um, okay, so this is, I think this is a big problem for a lot of people. Um, when they cook at home, they're just not delighted with it in the same way that restaurant food mm. is. So why is restaurant mm. food, not, not mm -hmm. from the experience standpoint, but why is it literally tastier than homemade food? <laughs> oh, so I think there's two components. Okay. Both are important. <clears throat> One is what are we talking about when we're talking about restaurant food? And I think mostly we're talking about um, chain restaurants or fast food or pizza. Mm -hmm. um, that's kind of like, or maybe Tex-Mex Mexican food. That's kind of like what most people in our region go out to go eat, right? Yeah. Um, or burger chains. Okay, so those places are using an inordinate amount of salt and um, fat um, and sugar when they prepare their food. If you were to look at most of their calorie counts, which do at your own peril, but yeah. um, you literally could not make a quesadilla at your house that, I mean, it would be real hard that has 1,200 calories in it, but at Cadoba, that's standard. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, and it doesn't leave you feeling any fuller than when you made it your house. I, I wonder often how they do it. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah. But I do know that one of the reasons that food is so appealing is because they are specifically engineering it and they have engineers and scientists designing this food in a lab kitchen somewhere so that it hits all your buttons. Mm -hmm. One of my friends is one of these people at McDonald's now, well, a, a friend from college, um, <laughs> literally spending all day every day trying to figure out how to hit those buttons for you so that you come back and spend another $3 on, you know, McDonald's breakfast so mm -hmm. that they can break even at 9.30 in the morning. <laughs> That's every crazy. Day, do they, they really? Do. They do. That's... Yeah, most, most McDonald's locations break even at breakfast it's all gravy after that so think about that when we talk about oh, <laughs> the wages these people are paid yeah, seriously. Um, yeah, that, but that's that a different topic me. right um, <laughs> so they're feeding into these addictions and we are wired to just go for those things mm -hmm. evolutionarily biologically we want salt fat and sugar um, and if you notice sometimes the food doesn't have much other taste aside from that when it comes yeah. down to it, most of the time what you're making at home may have more flavor. But it does, and I feel that too, uh, that, that if I don't hit those buttons some way or another, I'm going to be craving something like that. I think it's just yeah. a part of the culture we grew up in. Yeah, definitely. Um, and one way I do that is um, by making myself dessert. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, you know, I try, I, you know, I have a lot of routines around my food so that I can enjoy the gourmand lifestyle without ballooning into an unhealthy weight for myself. Mm -hmm. um, but I do allow myself to eat dessert and that is an important part of me feeling satiety. We are wired that way. It's not your fault, you know, and you didn't make bad dinner probably. <laughs> yeah. yeah, satiety, uh, before we continue, is just satiation. It's being satisfied. Uh, it's just a particular word yes, that I wanted to make sure it was that feeling of not wanting more. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I think that's a really good point. Uh, one other thing with restaurants, and, and one that you touched on a little bit, and I'd like you to go a little bit deeper into that because I think it's something that's really important to you, is the aesthetic experience of eating at a nice restaurant. Not, not going to Five right. Guys and getting a burger. Going to a nice mm -hmm. white tablecloth restaurant, sit down, wine service, all that. Explain to me why that has, and I believe you do believe that has value, correct? I do. I do believe it has. Okay. Then, then and walk I, me I believe through it has the value, value of that thing. Yeah. Um, and I say this as somebody who, you know, has transcended um, from like a very, like, bottom rung poverty never experienced that in my life until I went to school for it mm -hmm. so I feel like there's a lot of class dynamic in this answer that is important to just acknowledge you know if it's not something people can afford to experience don't and you can come up with a million other ways to give yourself this treat um, but I do think even for those among us who have a little bit less resources, giving ourselves this experience is not that different than like going to the theater. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I mean like the art theater, like the, yeah. the play, play acting, um, not like the movie theater. Um, or going to um, uh, see, see an exhibition at a museum. Um, it's a sensory experience from beginning to end. It's about being taken care of um, especially if you can divorce the class dynamic and the exclusionary aspects of it from the experience of it, um, which is mostly what you'll experience if you go to a place, they're not gonna treat you like crap. <laughs> yeah. You're there to be their guest. Um, you, you come away feeling just almost a catharsis from beginning to end, being taken care of, even having your chair pulled out for you is a little thing that just, you don't, nobody does that, you know, for you. Yep. <laughs> and it's a, it's a, it encompasses your whole body, the sights, the sounds, the music that's selected, the texture of the tablecloth, the flowers on the table, the flickering of the candlelight, the fact that the lights are usually dim, it's a little quiet, it's almost meditative, and it takes a long time. It's not about becoming full and eating to become full, it's about eating to process the tastes and the smells that you're experiencing, and hopefully to eat things you don't normally eat every day. Um, and to accompany it with, with hopefully with wine, if you're of drinking age, um, to, to be able to offset the flavors of that 
meal just perfectly. Those things really do elevate each other. And so that's for me, the value is that aesthetic experience um, beginning to end. And and for me, it's very rare. I think it's been more than a year since I've, it has been more than a year since I've had that experience. But last time I had it, I went to a beautiful restaurant called the Pearl in, in um, Key West and, and I wept. I'm not kidding. I mean, it was it was beautiful. <laughs> I'm, I'm getting emotional thinking about it. I'm not kidding. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> so I hope everybody can have that experience. Yeah, and, and just to give people an idea, uh, we're not talking about $500 a plate. Um, what would be the range no. where you would consider this to be an example of this experience? What would be the price range? Yeah, I think you could do it. Um, so like that meal at the Pearl was, and we had a full bottle of wine five courses and I think you could do it for a little less like you could have one bottle of wine and no aperitif and two or three courses um so anywhere between 150 for two people to 350 for two people um so yeah that's a huge amount of money for most people again it's about that singular experience yeah but this is one of those events where you actually dress nicely and it's a it is what you're doing that evening um Yes. And if yeah. anybody's look at, looked at the price of like Disney World tickets, maybe that $300 for that meal yes. really isn't that bad. <laughs> no, it's so true. And the, and the, I mean, we, hopefully we agree that it's a valuable experience as a culture and um, can, can encourage chefs who do this. You know, if you're going to spend the money, it's important to do your research in advance. Mm-hmm. Um, make sure that you go to a place that has a good reputation for prioritizing service. Um, mm-hmm. and that has a chef that is able to maybe on their website or something articulate what they're trying to do and that that articulation of what they're trying to do resonates with you. I think that's a really <laughs> Before good point. Before you go spend yeah. 400 bucks. Yeah, don't know? just look at Yelp. Uh, go look at what that Mm-mm. chef is saying about their own restaurant because much like the art world, uh, it's really important to know why this person's doing this thing and what their what their values are and yeah. make sure that their values are kind of going to line up with what you want to experience that evening yeah i think it's a really important one um let's see oh this is a fun one so you've worked in commercial kitchens right uh, yeah yes and <laughs> what yes, yes. um i was making, making sure i hadn't lost you um no. What pro tools, what are those like professional, either professional versions of kitchen tools or tools that you only see in a mm-hmm. restaurant? What of those are like the mm-hmm. tempting ones that you almost want to like take up the space in your house with? <laughs> well, I can tell you, I actually have one taking up space in my house. Um, that would be a meat slicer. <laughs> ah. A true professional meat slicer. I have to admit, I haven't actually used it. But <laughs> I'm devoting a significant amount of space in my very small house to storing it. And it even plugs into normal power. So, like, hypothetically, I could just pull it out and, and use it. It's just heavy. <laughs> yeah. Um, but that would be my, my answer. It's something that you don't see at home that, that's pretty tempting because it's really hard to slice beautiful cured meats as thinly as you want, even when you have really good knife skills. Yeah, and we're not talking about, like, cutting salami from the store we're cutting we're t- you're talking about like prosciuttos and things like that that are very delicate yes okay. yes mm-hmm. do you want to talk about what tools kind of restaurants have in general a little bit um i think the answer that... might be surprising yeah if there's anything that's completely esoteric that might be um Mm-hmm. Com- like like just something that people wouldn't even think about that would be that would be cool but i think that um <laughs> but for the most part it's just pro versions of home stuff right like the oven at a the oven at a restaurant's going to have some cool toys in it but it's an oven it's a hot box right okay really it's remarkably simple i mean the the layout of a kitchen is going to have more equipment but of a smaller range than you probably suspect hmm so what yeah. are the tools that would like be different? Like 400 sheet pans. Yeah, yeah, that's true. <laughs> right. Uh, probably quality knives um, that, I mean, people bring their own knives. You know, really, I, I really want to emphasize how little, t- how few tools you really need to get the job done. Most restaurants have fewer tools than I think most people have in their kitchen. 
and that's um, just to because, do a broader variety of things. And that's probably just because the people using those tools have a greater range of skills and can use the fewer tools for a greater number of ends, correct? Absolutely. That's okay. exactly it. I think, you know, we've all seen so many pieces of marketing for like this tool or or that tool that saves your life. It cuts an apple, it cores an avocado, it stores your avocado. What are they um, called? Yeah, um, no. Unitaskers, right? <laughs> single use, yeah. yeah, unitaskers, single use objects. You really don't need it. I yeah. mean, you could outfit your kitchen with, I'm gonna say 12 things and have what you really need to do most of your work. Well, that's good to know. Work. Yeah, um, when we get into cooking for new people, I'd, I'd like to come back to that because I think that your um, okay. your ideas about that are, are good and important. Um, what you might not have have specific chefs, but what what sort of culinary movements like when I see something on Netflix, uh, what should I be concentrating mm -hmm. on if I'm either new to food or just interested in food in general? If I'm new to food and I haven't been exposed to the problems of industrialization of food, that would be where I would start. So yep. um, Michael Pollan's work um, mm -hmm. is, is I think, very fundamental. Um, yeah, for him, I, would, I, would, yeah, I, I personally think... like uh, Botany of Desire is probably my favorite of his because it's the least, yes. it's the least preachy. <laughs> Yes. And, and that's what you got to watch out for is um, I would if you don't know about, you know, the impacts of companies like Monsanto on our food supply chain and how that literally impacts what we eat in our house yep. <laughs> and our health, like I would start searching out that stuff. Um, it's interesting because it doesn't really come down to like um, what you might cook or influence your cooking skills. But I think it changes the way you think about food and increases the value of good food. Um, to an individual who understands those things. Hmm. Okay. So yeah. I would start with that, understanding the industrial impacts um, on our food supply chain through whatever mechanism. And I think Michael Pollan is a good start. Yeah, I think he's uh, he's also um, relatively readable. He's not quite as dense as some of the others can be. Uh, yeah, and he does have, a, I think it was a special on Netflix that was for four topics yeah he did the i'm gonna have to put that in the notes or something I can't remember it yeah I'll, I'll have to i'll have to find it and put it in the notes but yeah it's a four-part series i think it was god no i can't it was just like four methods of cooking i just completely forget some space and... yes yeah and so he talks not only about methodology of cooking which is nice but also how that has changed do the dynamics i just expressed it's kind of a good one yeah stop shop for Cool. I think that'd be a good one for people who haven't seen it. I'll, I'll definitely find that and put it in the comments. Um, what I'm also seeing is more elevation of um, ethnic cuisine, like um, Share Dreams of Sushi, um, which I haven't personally Netflix. actually seen. I have a difficult time with food television because I'm not really working in the industry. I have a lot of emotion around it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I'm probably not the best person to ask about like what is interesting. Um, but I do think I like the elevation of what you, you know, you've defined as peasant food as something that's interesting to talk about. Mm -hmm. And I've seen more of that. Come yeah, I've up. started to see that come up as well. And if you've not watched Hero Dreams of Shushi, you could, you should, because it is, it's really different. I think than a lot of American <laughs> food television is, um, it's very Japanese, very Japanese. <laughs> um, okay, um, I think that covers a lot of the pro stuff. That is there anything that 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 people should know about professional kitchens or or, or professionally produced food that's different than what they make at home, or do we kind of cover it? Well, I mean, the methodology is different. The <laughs> actually, maybe most. People don't, they're not making every plate right for you at all. Like, mm -hmm. if you've never worked in a kitchen, you might not understand that they parboil your pasta and store it in cold plastic baggies and then reboil it and then put sauce on it in the pan and then put it on your plate. Like, they're not boiling your pasta for you. <laughs> so, um, I, I noticed this when I came back to Tallahassee and lived with my mother in law, like the way that I would cook and batches and save things for later until it was more convenient for me to use she just she's an excellent cook 
um, and things would blow her mind. And I think that's kind of what brings it up for me is that I don't think most people know how much of restaurant food is made well in advance and then prepared in, you know, one-off batches for you when hmm. you eat it. That's a good point. Um, yeah, I think that is something that most people probably don't have, uh, have a lot of experience with. Um, okay, so one thing, since we kind of talked about the industrialization of food, I think that, that it's, um, this is kind of a hard segue, but we're going to do it anyway. Um, cooking okay. for restricted diets. There's a lot of, mm. there's a lot of people that just legit have allergies, right? You have one thing you just can't eat and that's fine. Mm -hmm. And, um, when we have new people over for dinner, um, or dinner parties where we have people who we're not used to, um, that's one of our first questions. What are your allergies? What are your food restrictions? Um, and I think that, that nowadays we're a little past that we've gotten into restricted diets that are voluntary for a variety of reasons. And, <laughs> um, I just kind of want your opinion on that because there are some that are morally based, right? If you, if you keep kosher, that's a moral mm -hmm. thing. If you're vegan or vegetarian, that can be a moral thing. Um, what are your opinions mm -hmm. on the on the food restrictions that are not morally based and and the ones that are morally based for that matter so um you know most people i know it's not a nice question you know as a cook this is complicated i think it's a good question um and i wonder how it shows up in non-food world but it's one of those things where you do see more of it, I feel like, these days, like um, keto or, um, gluten -free. you know, there's diet-based, there's gluten-free, there's, you know, soy-free. <sighs> I, I really think most people come to these positions from a place where they're trying to do the right thing for themselves mm -hmm. or for their body or for the environment or for the world or for animals. Um, and so regardless of what the food restriction is, I've come to a position over time, which I did not always hold, um, that it's my job to respect that and to to cater to it, literally. Um, <laughs> and you you and Sarah do a great job of this. I mean, y'all are heavy meat eaters and, um, you know, tons of flour. And yet when you have one of these wonderful parties you have, you ask and you, you accommodate. Um, hospitality is about meeting people where they are and taking care of them in your space and if they whether you think it's legitimate or not whether i think it's legitimate or not decide not to eat peanuts when they touch um rosemary then okay that's easy enough for me to accommodate <laughs> that's sort of my position on it but I, I you can hear in my answer that i haven't always felt that way yeah. <laughs> so i've been on both sides and for you know if you're going to a rest and you have a dietary concern like this i hate when people assume that they won't be taken care of mm -hmm. um a good restaurant will i think have that opinion even if they're grumbling about it a little bit because it makes yeah. more work for them and they're underpaid and they're going home late anyways and they never see their kids that's sort of the dynamics that they're dealing with when they hear that you now can't have the 16 things they made today um yeah. but most of the time they're still going to want if to accommodate to the degree that they can mm -hmm. um so ask don't assume don't assume yeah i liked your comment of uh like, meeting people where they are i think that's a really mm -hmm. good place and even if you don't agree with it or believe in it meet them there and then if you want to walk them mm -hmm. somewhere else you can work on that <laughs> yeah. or, or if you don't you know maybe it's not your job <laughs> well, well yeah yeah and that's, and that's um, <laughs> it's only if you have a particular opinion about it and that can be from yeah, the other right. angle too there are people who um right. are vegetarian who will kind of work other people towards that thing or are vegan and mm -hmm. will kind of work right. towards that thing but i think your statement of meeting people where they are then after that whatever but meeting people where they are i think is a really right and if Right. Clean and look at it that. as an opportunity, right? I mean, yeah. if you're interested in learning about food and cooking and somebody you know can't have um, cheese and mm -hmm. you are having a wine and cheese party, 
that's a great opportunity to learn about how to make nut cheeses, which turn out to be really delicious yeah. <laughs> and totally within the realm of what most people can do at home if they give it a shot. So it just broadens your skill. Cool. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. Broadening your skills is also one way to look at it instead of just being put off because somebody who's coming to your dinner party can't eat meat. Well, now that gives you an opportunity to do something bizarre to get the job done. Um, Absolutely. I think Make it was it last year, the year before, where we made tamales with goose fat instead of lard and did made a bunch of changes to make them uh, pork-free. And that was really yes, interesting to yes. get that one done. I didn't even get to taste them at that party because they I were all gone either. so quick. <laughs> I think I got like one bite of one of them. Um, yeah. It's insane. So it was a hit, in other words, because yeah. you made a, a heap ton. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's one of those recipes where you always double it, and that's even that's not even enough. Um, okay, so on, the, on that of um, kind of people with restricted diets and kind of trying to do the best thing for your body and stuff like that. Um, there's a lot of trending things with that where, where it's keto this year and it's uh, gluten-free or it's, uh, what's the other one, where people eat what like old humans ate, but they always get it wrong. Um, paleo. Paleo, <laughs> yeah, that's the one. Uh, yeah. The paleo diet. And so there's a lot of food trends and stuff. And I kind of separate from that but but i think very related and i think something that a lot of people get hung up on is the numbers that we associate with food is the numbers that are on the nutrition facts on the back mm -hmm. of the box mm -hmm. um which of course don't show up when you just buy an apple or a cucumber at the store or even mm -hmm. like a, a slab of meat mm -hmm. at the store you don't get those numbers for um what are your opinions mm -hmm. on those numbers do you look at those numbers at all Oh, that's a loaded question, man. Um, yeah, I know. Okay, that's so I can answer this from a personal perspective and yes. not a professional perspective. That's what I want. Is that I don't okay? want a professional perspective. Okay. Um, what, you, what do you do? Okay, because I'm not a professional. I'm not a healthcare professional. No, okay. no, no. no. So, Neither am I, Jesus. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, okay, coming from a childhood of scarcity, has influenced this answer. Uh, never having enough of anything and having to make it work has led to an adult that can't stand calorie counting. I also struggle with my weight, personally. I always have. I just, it's in my genes. Um, and I love good food, as we've discussed. So, <laughs> uh, a dilemma. And I am an active person. I've exercised regularly for my adult life and a lot of my childhood, but it's still a struggle for me. Mm -hmm. So I've gone through periods where I've lost a good amount of weight by calorie counting using apps like MyFitnessPal. And it was so hard with the cooking to get it anywhere close to what was reasonable. It took a lot of time. I'm a very busy person. I don't have a lot of free time. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it just made me feel like I was always overspending. I didn't have enough money at the time. I didn't have enough calorie budget. I just didn't have enough of anything. And it made me really angry. Um, eventually, I mean, I stuck with it for three years because I'm a very persistent person <laughs> and very good at subjugating my own emotions and feelings for what I believe to be the right thing. And it worked for me pretty good um, from a weight perspective, but eventually it, it just wasn't, didn't mesh with my values. Mm. Um, my um, mother-in-law, you know, started for health reasons to do intermittent fasting. Mm -hmm. And that I've done for more than a year now. Um, I don't eat breakfast and I don't eat lunch most days. And I don't care about what I eat when I eat dinner. <laughs> uh. I don't calorie count. I don't look at the numbers. And I'm finding that I eat way less in general and that I feel much better. Um, so that has really changed that dynamic for me. Before, I would say I was pretty obsessed with it and now I'm not and I feel like I have so much more time and I get to enjoy my food more um and it's not that hard for me to to not eat most of the time actually to my own surprise because yeah. I kind of spent most of my time hungry either way <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that's I'm like well designed for a pandemic man like I just pack on the pounds so <laughs> I you know I'd survive you know <laughs> a global food shortage but yeah, I always worry about that. In modern society. I cook for Sarah, or sometimes when we cook together, um, it's always looking for things that are low calorie, and then I'm looking for things that I'm like, can I put more fat in this? Can more animal 
creatures go in this um how do we get more calories <laughs> into this thing and so it's always kind of a right uh, a little bit because you have the uh, yeah yep yeah because you're more of a person who sheds weight naturally yes although hopefully as i get older yeah. that will stop and i can eat like a normal human being right <laughs> part of it is too though you know the nutrition is a lot of times in the fat and in the calories mm -hmm. yes. <laughs> um of course, greens are a great source of nutrition that also don't have a lot of calories, but so much of the good stuff is in the calorie stuff. <laughs> yeah. um, so you can run into a place where you're under, you're not delivering the nutrients you need, um, even if you're technically eating enough food. That's really hard. Yeah, yeah, that can be. Did that answer your question? Yes, it did. Thank you. That was, that was <laughs> exactly what I was looking for. Um, and one thing that I kind of, speaking of Michael Pollan, um, one thing that, that he said that I think was really interesting is that you can have whatever food you want as long as you make it from scratch because it's such a pain mm. and it's so much energy and time <laughs> to make it from scratch that you start to you know. care more. Well, and you just know what yeah. went into it. Like when you see a stick and a half of butter go into a dessert, you're just like aware that that stick and a half of butter is somewhere in there. <laughs> I I think that that is a valid point and I also remember him saying that and I was like not me I can make anything <laughs> and it's easy it's all easy I can't I can't ascribe by that rule <laughs> yeah see I'm, I'm I don't think I'm as efficient as you are so it takes me like a good afternoon to make anything big so yeah, I think it works for me <laughs> right yeah it probably works for most people yeah when you get into batch making or, or tray bakes that's when you really get in trouble um when I realized that <laughs> I think I figured out that one of my recipes for, I think, cinnamon buns was 8,000 calories a tray. I was like, oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> right. And just remember, if a restaurant that was a, probably a chain or a national company or a regional chain made cinnamon rolls, a tray of them would probably be twice or that, three yeah. times as much yeah. as that. Isn't that insane? Yes. I don't know how they pack it all in there. A lot of science and skill. Probably more yeah. science than school, honestly. <laughs> um, okay, cool. So let's get to the last bit of this, and the one that, that I think is going to be good for a lot of people nowadays because they're all stuck at home trying mm -hmm. some of these fancy things for the new, for the first time. <clears throat> uh, let's start with the very <laughs> basics. I have freshmen that okay. have never boiled water before. Ever. I know. Yeah. I used to teach them. Um, <laughs> Uh, and where do you start? Oh, yeah. First, well, let's actually, actually go to that thing. Let, let, let's actually start with tools. I'm at the, I'm at Target okay. or, or I'm not at Target right now because we're not allowed to go to Target. Target. I'm on Target's website looking for tools. Mm -hmm. What tools do I need? I have mm -hmm. an empty kitchen. Yeah. Um, Target might be able to supply these things, but you might do better on Amazon. I okay, hate to that's say. fine too. Yeah, um, whichever's works. I don't mind. Just there's kind of a broader range of things. So, uh, you need a chef's knife, which is I, just the basic. Eight to nine inches is what most people like. I would recommend a nine inch chef's knife. Um, you need a serrated knife, a twelve inch. That's what most people would call a bread knife. Okay. Um, and you need a paring knife. So we're talking three knives, right? only three knives a chef's knife a paring knife and a bread knife and a paring knife is the little i particularly small one like that um yeah but it's not the one with the backwards curve right no it looks a lot like the chef's knife it's just baby it's okay. small it's about three to four inches at the most mm -hmm. um and uh, most people could probably get away with even not having a paring knife if your funds were really limited um, but each of those knives, you can get a good one for like 10 to 20 bucks on Amazon, right? Not good. Not the chef's knife will probably run you a little bit higher. Um, but even if you just wanted to start off with a 10 to $20 one to get a feel for it, you, you could. Okay. What else do I need? Um, you need, need a cutting board. And I recommend getting a big cutting board with a well, which is a, um, a groove cut all around it so that you can accommodate large large cuts of meat and everything small, right? Mm -hmm. um, the smaller your cutting board, the more irritating it is to do large things on. So yes. it really irritates me to work on a cutting board that's too small. It's like my biggest pet peeve. I recommend a big cutting board. 
It can be plastic. Um, plastic's probably more versatile than wooden because it's easy to sanitize. Yes, you can throw it in the So dishwasher. those are your cutting tools. Right. You need um, a oh, mixing sorry, uh, bowl. Big, like, big cutting go ahead. board is how big? Are we talking about like 24 by 18? Oh, good point. Yeah, that's that's a good start. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think we use um, ones that I think you find a little bit too small. We use those ones. I do, ones, yeah. yes. But I what I like about them is you have so many of them and you just change them out. But yeah, they are too small. <laughs> <laughs> um then, you know, you need bowls. I think a set of stainless steel or glass, whichever one is more economical to you. Um, uh, mixing bowls, you need a whisk mm -hmm. and you need a spatula. Mm -hmm. um, for a spatula, I recommend if you can spending the money to get the um, rubber made, uh, I think it's 12 to 14 inches. It's a monster, it's huge, it's wonderful. Um, and it's probably 25 bucks. It's like the most expensive spatula you'll ever buy, but it might be the only one you ever buy. <laughs> yes, it's those amazing. Tools are great. Um, so that's like a specific call for that. I'm not an advertiser for them, but I definitely <laughs> recommend that one. <laughs> you can tell I'm a pastry chef because I have a specific spatula I recommend. There you, go. Um, you need measuring cups, dry or wet. Eh, if you're doing things by volume, it's imprecise anyway. So just go with whatever you like. You don't need both, okay. but you can have both. You need a strainer of some kind, like a colander. If you can only pick one strainer, I would get a mesh strainer because you can always dra like drain pasta in a mesh strainer, but you can't drain, like you can't filter sauces through a colander. So you can oh. just get one mesh strainer. That's a good point. Um, <laughs> and then you need a Y peeler. It's you know, a vegetable peeler, but I recommend a, the shape that's a Y. It's just so much more, uh, ergonomic well is that a word um ergonomic to work with <laughs> um than what most people think of as a vegetable peeler and you'd really use that over a paring knife for a new person oh yes a peeler over a paring knife to peel vegetables definitely yeah, okay. yeah. if i had to pick one i'd probably pick a oh, my okay. i don't know my colleagues in the world might disagree with me but that's my opinion <laughs> that's fine this is your opinion it's just my opinion yeah um, and then you need a stock pot and a sauce pot. A stock pot is what you would think of like you, your mom or dad probably boiled pasta in. It's like taller than normal pot and has a lid on it. Um, and you need a sauce pot, which is just like most people would just call it a pot, like with a handle and a lid. Um, you need a baking sheet. And then there's one last thing you need, um, a baking sheet or a sheet pan some people call them cookie sheets. Just one will do ya if yeah. you're trying to get started. And you need hot pads. Oh, yes. <laughs> um, which I recommend getting what are called um, side towels, if you can. Um, Those are the ones that hot pads. us, right? Yeah, they are thick weave cotton. They're about $10 a piece, which sounds really expensive, but they last, you don't use them to do anything but get hot things out of the oven and move hot things around. And they're just so much more um, just durable yeah. <laughs> and safe than hot pads. Uh, hot pads tend to catch on fire and have holes in them or they're very easy to get wet by accident. Um, and then if you use a wet hot, everybody knows if you've put something wet to move something hot, you are hurt. Yes. <laughs> I, I really appreciate having good towels instead of hot pads. I don't have a single hot pad in my kitchen. Yeah, I don't think we do it anymore either because once we got those, we've just replaced all of our stuff with those ones. They're just so good. <laughs> so we really just talked about a little over 12 items and some of them are optional. And, you know, I think for somebody starting off, if you're really interested in cooking, you don't need more than that. I was really thinking about it last night. Um, walking around my kitchen, I don't have much more than that. I mean, I have like a ton of knives because I have been interested in them. Yeah. I have more cooking she baking sheets because I um, bake a lot. <laughs> yes. um, uh, I have cool ceramic dishes because I got married and people gave them to me. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know oh but one thing i did forget was a, a 
uh, saute pan. And if I could only pick one, I would just pick a 10 or 12 inch um, cast iron pan. You can do all of everything you need in there. Yeah, I agree. One, we agree on that one. <laughs> <laughs> Those are important. Um, so yeah, that, that, that's a really good, simple set of stuff. I mean, if you were going on Amazon for all that, even if you bought nice stuff, you're well under 200 bucks. Um, probably under 150 if you're being careful. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and so that's really not bad for a full set of tools. Um, one thing, I, uh, well, so I think that's a good set of, of, of tools and things. Um, I was going to ask what were the starting things to keep as ingredients, but I think that that is very mm, dependent on what hard. cuisine you want to cook. <laughs> Um, yeah, like yeah, we keep I agree. An That's ungodly well-stocked kitchen, and it takes up a huge amount of our house. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. we actually had to take out a bedroom at our house to make our kitchen big enough to hold all our junk. Um, and <laughs> yeah, you've worked in that kitchen before. Um, mm -hmm. But so, is there a like starter set of ingredients, or does it really? just depend on the cuisine you're looking at and the recipes you're trying to make. I would start with what you want to make. Um, and if you can buy more than what you need for that recipe, um, spices are really hard for especially young people to acquire mm -hmm. um, because they're so expensive at the grocery store. I'm going to make a recommendation for a website called myspicesage.com. It's incredibly economical to buy very good quality spices from that website there's probably others like it um but it just saves so much money compared to going and buying like a tablespoon of ginger at the grocery store for six dollars yeah. um, it's a crime that what they charge you at the grocery store another good source um for spices can often be eth ethnic um, grocery stores which i know in montgomery you have really good sources there yeah if if you're listening to this um, in montgomery um alabama um there is capital supermarket on southern boulevard which uh, we lovingly call the every ethnic grocery store because depending on which mm -hmm. aisle you're on, you are in a completely different style of cooking and it is wonderful and amazing and there are things right. there that I've never seen in a grocery store before. Uh, so that's my shout out. For you know, them. and now's a really hard time. Yeah, it's a great place. Now's a really hard time to, to think about this just because it's hard to get, I mean, it's hard to get flour right now, which is mm -hmm. tough for me. Um, but in general, if somebody were starting off and like it wasn't a pandemic, I'd say every time you go to the grocery store for your ingredients, just get more than you need um, so that you start to build a pantry. Mm -hmm. And um, like if it calls for one thing of coconut milk, get two or three, and then you're slowly spending the money you need to build up a pantry instead of having to think about it all at once. And it's going to be stuff you've used before because you're buying it for something. And so you'll have a familiarity with it and you'll be more likely to say, hey, I use that for that. Maybe it would be good in this um, as you build your experimentation skills. Yes, and I think experimentation is a really important thing. I think this is one thing that some people don't do that I think is important. Um, this is something mm -hmm. that I've, I've started to do a few years ago is before I put an ingredient in that's new, that I've not experienced that ingredient alone before, I will eat some of it um, if it's safe to do so. Um, just mm -hmm. to like, what does coconut milk actually taste like if I just eat it on a spoon? Um, and mm -hmm. I think that that gives you a lot of knowledge about something that you actually can't get out of a finished meal, which is odd, but yeah. I mean, it, it kind of makes yeah. sense, I guess. But I found that to be very val very valuable for, oh, this actually tastes like this other thing. So if I'm out of this, then I know I can use this other thing. Mm -hmm. And being able to experiment really depends on skills that you develop. And as far as where do you start learning how to cook, uh, oh, that's so tough. I feel like so many people try to boil cooking down into like their one simple methodology. Cooking is universal everyone across the globe uses more or less the same essential cooking techniques. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, learn how to saute, learn how to make pasta, learn how to bake simple bread, um, learn how to grill if you can, um, learn how to roast. 
mm-hmm. <laughs> and and try to just follow people if you're interested in people cooking on Instagram or I don't know what people use TikTok or whatever I don't know um, <laughs> if they're if they're saying there's a shortcut or something there's not people have been cooking for ever <laughs> so it makes us human and mm. there are no shortcuts like it's simple stuff there's not a magical way to do anything um, the older the methodology the more true that is yes. you know roasting is always always the same while. process yeah. of browning and then putting in a low temperature oven until a thing is tender <laughs> yeah i think every time um, a um a recipe calls for onions to be browned and they say it takes five minutes i just want to murder somebody <laughs> it doesn't take five minutes <laughs> is that because it takes longer yeah yeah it takes forever or yeah yeah it, it takes a long time. Yeah. Yeah. You can speed it up if you put salt on them. Yes, yes. But, but... that's because salt draws out water. It's not a magical trick. No. Um, yeah, and little things yeah. like that you either learn from a teacher or just kind of learn by practice. Um, I'm mm-hmm. definitely faster now in my early 30s than I was when I was in my early 20s cooking. I'm definitely better mm-hmm. at it. Jeez. If I could recommend one resource for learning how to cook, it would probably be Julia Child's The Way to Cook, not her book that she became famous for, The Art of French Cuisine, Mm -hmm. um, but her later book, The Way to Cook. I have it on my shelf, and it will go through all of the basic cooking techniques in a very practical and understandable way. Um, And of course, you'll get to learn all of her you know, things she was famous for, like beef, pork, and yam. I used her book to cook my goose, actually, and it turned out stellar. So I learned from Julia, too, even though I'm trained. <laughs> buying that book new is expensive, but buying it used is, is it? super uh, cheap. Yeah. A new copy is okay. 55 bucks. It's a hefty tome. But it's there's hardback. used ones that are $4, so no excuse, guys. <laughs> there you go. You can go get a used one for 4 bucks. <laughs> And if you're anything like me, your your cookbooks are going to get covered with stuff anyway. So, um. yes, definitely. I'm not one of those people who's like, you know, I <laughs> just have I make a mess everywhere. So. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> my cookbooks have to hold up to it. Okay, so on the topic of um, starting cooking, I think that a lot of people, even if they are decent cooks, have started baking recently, um, and that's a whole universe of landmines. Um, (laughs) and one thing uh, as far as tools go um, I've become a big fan of weighing all my ingredients for baking Uh, like Mm -hmm. I just Mm -hmm. don't measure anything by volume anymore and the moment I get a new recipe I immediately do the conversions to weight and just do it off the weight Um, is that just me because that's what I like or, or is that something that is the way you guys do it too and how is there any value to doing it by volume that I'm missing? Yeah, that's a good question. For repeatability, volume is absolutely better. I'm wondering, are you converting using standard conversions or actually weighing your ingredients to convert them and while you write it down? Um, for some things, it is standard. For some things that I know are going to be different, I try to do it um, standard. Mm-hmm. So like if I know, you know, so if somebody asks for like a <laughs> tablespoon of black, of ground black pepper, that's going to be different depending on the grind. So I will yeah, try yeah. to weigh that out with my black pepper and then I write the weight down and that's what stays right. in my little book. Okay. Um, I think that's much better for consistency. It's actually not the way I cook. We um, have a favorite scale in the world was called easy scale and it's a big big scale and it's very easy to use and interestingly um but we had friends who were starting a business and needed it more than we did and when we gave it away we never got a new one (laughs) Uh, and so for years now i actually haven't weighed anything but of course in a professional environment with baking you are not using volume you are not using cups you are using pounds ounces or the metric system um in a professional environment because it comes down to that repeatability a cup of flour depending on the humidity the elevation could be a totally different actual amount of flour and you cannot risk that in the professional environment Mm -hmm. um but i've already alluded to the fact that i'm pretty much an experimenter and i think you know it comes down to the skills Mm -hmm. and i'm also a lot of times personally in a little bit of a hurry when it comes to baking and i think 
baking with volume is a little faster. <laughs> That's so funny, because um, I find it so much faster so, to do it by weight. Be interesting. So, different experience there. Well, and I wonder it's um, if it's because that I'm not doing multiple step stuff. I'm just throwing everything in a bowl, yeah. and so I can just keep hitting right. tear and put the new ingredient in and mm -hmm. hit tear again and hit and put the new ingredient in. Yeah, yeah. And also it keeps Another me from getting... Another thing that's a problem... I was going to say, it keeps you from getting Go yelled ahead. at for leaving a bunch of dirty spoons everywhere. <laughs> right. But you are doing the step of converting first, which... When I do an initial recipe, I'm impatient. yeah. Yeah. Yeah, right. So pretty much every time I'm baking, I'm looking... Like, I'll look up something online. I'm like, okay, um, I want to make, like, just this past weekend, I wanted to make gingerbread mm -hmm. cupcakes. Ooh. So I looked at, like, five different recipes online, and... They're all volume, of course, because this is America, mm -hmm. and I didn't, I, you know, it didn't even occur to me to go through the conversions, and I don't have a scale, so of course I did it by volume. And I, I measure very imprecisely by volume because at its core, volume is not precise. So I'm not going to waste like a single second of time like fluffing up my flour and leveling it off like they tell you to. I, I think that's ridiculous. <laughs> it's imprecise already in your house. Like, just do your best. <laughs> Um, packed brown sugar whatever just make it a little bit of a bigger scoop i don't know yep. <laughs> and maybe this is bad advice but it's definitely the way i bake <laughs> well no and i think it's and i think it's fine that there are different ways to do it i think it's important for people to know that like even the people who are really good at this stuff can do it imprecisely and still get something right definitely yeah um, yeah, so, and I think people mess up baking a lot. You've seen a lot of memes going around during the pan pandemic of yes. people not uh, getting successful results with their baking. Yes. Baking isn't a science compared to cooking. They're both the same. <laughs> the only difference between them is the order of operations and your ability to adjust course midstream. I don't think that the inability to adjust course midstream makes something a science. So I, mm -hmm. I really have a problem with the definition that people throw around of cooking is an art, baking is a science. I just, as you can tell, it gets my goat a little. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, you know, it's also more apparent if something doesn't rise, it's flat, it's yes. disgusting, it's unedible. If you don't season something appropriately, you may not even know what's wrong. You're just like, oh, this is pretty good. You don't know it could be better. Yeah, that's pretty... if you seasoned it better with better skill yeah. um but with baking you know it, it's pretty apparent when something goes wrong you burned it you drastically misscaled you forgot an ingredient you can't do that no. you know i mean so you should get over it i'll never forget um i made one time when i was a teenager um i wanted to make all my teachers don't judge me gifts <laughs> for Christmas and I had bananas and I was just going to make a crap ton of banana bread, but I forgot the sugar. Ooh, that's going to be Ooh. special. You know, I still remember what that tastes like today. Really? Like in my oh, mouth, God. I can taste it. Yes, it was awful. It tasted a lot like banana, <laughs> but not imagine. like what you wanted. No. So, you know, I had ruined it. I had ruined it. I ruined probably 15 loaves because even back then I was baking in large quantities and that was a tragedy but similarly i was making a large batch of ground beef and i mistook chili powder for cloves Ooh. and seasoned an entire batch of of ground beef with cloves instead of chili powder and that also ruined it and it didn't mean it was baking nor that it was a science it was that uh, i screwed up <laughs> you, you you could make that work you just got to go a little middle eastern with it or north african you'd be all right oh no not when you put much? in so much that okay, it numbs yeah. your mouth. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I guess just sharing those mistakes because everybody makes them. Um, and I even recently forgot something as important as salt in something I was making um, just because I got allowed myself to get distracted. Yeah. And I think one thing that, that can catch up new cooks and new bakers is teaspoons and tablespoons look so similar mm -hmm. on a piece of paper. And they don't feel wrong mm -hmm. when you're putting it in, but what there's three <laughs> there's three teaspoons to a tablespoon if I remember right, and that's a huge Correct. difference if you mess it up one way or the other. 
Oh, yes. Yeah. That's bitten me more than yes, once. Yes, little T is teaspoon, big T is tablespoon. Yes. <laughs> um, yes, I think that baking as science myth is, is a good one to call out. Um, I think another thing is just like, I've done two loaves of bread that go into the oven right after each other other, and for the exact same recipe, and they come out different. And that if somebody mm-hmm. keeps telling you it's a science, then you just start to hate yourself for it, as opposed to just realizing that yes. like, some things just aren't going to work right. Right. Yeah. There are so many variables. Yeah. Um, it's just never going to be exactly the same. If you made it later the in the same. day, it was probably warmer. It probably proofed faster. It yep. probably was a little overproofed and a little drier when it came out of the oven. Yeah, and that's... So. I think that some people get disheartened by being told that. Mm-hmm. I think that's an important thing to kind of take mm-hmm. away from it is saying that, no, it's an art. Sometimes it comes out great. And every once in a while, even though at this point I've probably made two to 300 loaves of bread at least, and even every once in a while there'll still be one mm-hmm. where I'm like, this is not food. Right, right. That's a really good point. And I think it's really important for people to remember when you're learning anything you know, anything, you get better at it over time if with continued application of mm-hmm. knowledge and, and practice. And with food, you know, you're so looking forward to eating that thing that I think yeah. the pain of failure can be really, really salient. Yes. <laughs> yeah, it, it hits you a Especially little closer if you're to hungry, home. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you were making your own dinner and now it's just crap. It's yeah. burned or something yeah. about it isn't right. Um, but, you know, everybody makes mistakes. I made something recently that was dry as heck, and I hardly wanted to eat it myself. Um, but you know, it's just, it was a part of something I was trying, and, and I move on. I don't, except for pie, bringing it back to the beginning. Yep. I don't hate myself when something doesn't go right in the kitchen. Yep, yep, yep. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I think you helped me one time when I made an entire leg of lamb inedible by cooking it in a sous vide for too long. <laughs> oh, I have blocked that out, Wyndham. Yeah, yeah, that was awful, but you fixed it. You made meatballs that were really good. Nice. Um, oh, we actually that's used that nice same trick to rescue a to rescue a recent uh, batch of of actually pork that didn't quite come out right. Um, mm. So, for new people, what should they what for new? Well, let, let's actually just stick on baking. For people who are new to baking okay. or trying this thing for the first time, give me like three recipes that they should be practicing. Like, what should they be nailing? Like, this is if they're going to wake up and learn to bake this morning. These are the three things they need to do, mm. or five, or two. I don't know. How okay. Many. Yeah. Okay. Three things. Let's go with three. Okay. Number one, um, cookies with the creaming method, which will be where you're beating a bunch of butter with sugar at first till it's light and fluffy. Okay. Master that. Uh, most people do not take that step far enough. The first step where you're creaming the room temperature butter with the sugar, you stop too early. Keep going with it until it completely changes texture, and you'll find that you have a much better product. So cookies, I think. Everybody loves cookies. Yes, everybody loves um, like cookies. And even if you do them badly, <laughs> they're still edible most of the time. <laughs> Yes, and for just starting off, I would also recommend quick breads, which are things like muffins and banana bread. Um, Find some recipes that you trust, um, that you like, or that you've heard are good um, in those domains. And some of them will use the creaming method, just like cookies, but others will just be what's called um, the, uh, well, no, I'm forgetting the name of it. It's like straight or straight combination method, where you're just mixing oil and eggs with flour, and it's important to get the order right um, so mm-hmm. you don't have lumps. But the key here is not over mixing. People want it to be so smooth and perfect that they turn it into rocks. I had a friend who made muffins and uh, <laughs> rebranded them as as protein scones to save face for her <laughs> so that people didn't have an expectation and it was her only mistake was over mixing it and it was a terrible mistake <laughs> oh um and then the third thing i would lur- like for people to try is is bread don't be afraid to try yeasted bread mm-hmm. um a really good place to start would be um for I think it's really accessible to people at home is Jim Leahy's no need bread methodology. Mm-hmm. You can just look it up online, Jim Leahy. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a good way to discover that you can make 
crusty delicious bread at home but i also think you could go in a different direction with that and find your grandma's crisco white bread recipe that we talked about earlier mm -hmm. and just try that um give it a shot see what you like about the process people are terrified of making yeasted bread and i think it's such a shame it's a very rewarding process it's the thing that probably tastes the best when you eat it we've eaten bread for so long as a species you know yes. um it's really rewarding to be able to turn flour and water and yeast and salt and nothing else into something that's so tasty you just want to keep eating it until you crack, collapse <laughs> yes and then the other thing with bread i think you guys told me was that i have to let it completely cool before i cut it or it ruins it y yes you'll smoosh it yeah let it, it gets let smushy. It cool. <laughs> um, it's so hard to do and also for all those people at home that are having trouble finding yeast at the store just buy it on amazon you can get it in like one pound quantities for like 10 bucks uh, and just it's leave so it true, yeah. And then you keep it in your freezer. Yeah. Or the oh, fridge, yeah. I, I keep mine in the fridge. Does it do better in the freezer? Uh, well, actually, I keep some in the fridge, and then I keep my backup in the freezer. So both. <laughs> okay. okay. Um, and one thing that I realized recently that that uh, Max told me about was that there's a special kind of yeast for breads that have lots of fat and sugar in them. Um, so I got some of that and it yes. definitely makes a huge difference, although it messed up my recipe and timing so badly that now I have to redo that recipe. Um, so I'll have to <laughs> fix that, but it does work way better. Yeah. Uh, it just works too well. Yes, recipes are so specific, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And one thing with recipes that I think I would like to note, and I, and I kind of wonder your opinion on this is that I found that, um, if I find a recipe that was that's in the same like climate area, that seems to work a lot better. Mm -hmm. um, if I find hmm. something that's like the author like lives in Phoenix, that recipe doesn't seem to work mm. as well as somebody who like lives in Georgia. Is that just humidity <laughs> or what? Oh, it or could be a lot of different things actually, and maybe that. No, it 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 could be a lot of different things. So elevation is totally a real thing um, when it comes to baking um, but so are ingredients so in in okay so I grew up in the south I ate biscuits as a kid white lily flour um, is a thing you know everybody mm -hmm. in the south knows that I went to New York for school couldn't find white lily flour um, made biscuits using a, um, a, a pea flour all-purpose flour and added my own leavener and they were absolute rocks I hated them it turns out that the flour, AP flour in the South is different than AP flour in the North. The markets are so different. What people expect to get out of them is so different that people in the South want a softer wheat, people in the North want a harder wheat. And mm -hmm. so the same brand of flour or the grocery store brand of flour that's a, um, a AP will be uh, And AP <laughs> flour is all purpose result in flour. Different things. Yes, all-purpose all flour. So it could be a ton of little things like that adding up to you having a different result. And I really think that gets down to recipes for me are a recording of what happened that time. Um, mm, that's a and a possible prescription for what might happen this time. If all of the variables are the same, <laughs> you're in the yes. same mood, the temperature's the same, you're working with the same ingredients, your ingredients didn't get changed by the manufacturer, um, the humidity is the same, you know, then you'll probably get this, if you do everything right, you might get the same outcome. But I definitely like to loosen my definition of recipe to some, a, a historical document, what happened that day, and what I'd like to remember that I did, so that I can try to replicate it again. I like that. Um, I like the idea that And if that I do that, um, then I more flexibly. Yeah, I like the idea that it's a recording of what happened, not a prescription for what must happen next time. Absolutely. And for most of human history, people have not used recipes because they did not know how to read or write. <laughs> true. Yeah, um, and true. so people used um, ratios, the general idea of quantities compared to each other, um, and methods, ratios and methods. And the idea of a recipe would have been really foreign to our ancestors. Hmm. Um, That's really cool. It's good to know, I think, good to kind of have that context. Oh, and then one more thing for new people. Uh, and this isn't specifically baking, but just um, cooking in general. And one thing I put on my notes: food safety. Uh, yeah. <laughs> give me like the give me the quick rundown on how to not die. Oh my goodness, keeping food safety in mind is so important. Um, 
uh, especially because most of the time and in the age of pandemic, we're really thinking about our ability to influence um, other people's health. So this is a great topic for this time that we live in. Um, if you're cooking for your grandparents, you're cooking for somebody who is uh, an at-risk population. Mm -hmm. If they get a foodborne illness, you could kill them. You could literally kill them. Something that you would shrug off, you could kill them. Don't get scared though. It's just a few things that you need to keep in mind. Cook food to the proper temperature. I'm not gonna tell you what it is. Look it up. <laughs> your that's state's on the FDA's um, website. Uh, right? Yeah, FDA website or your state's um, professional board for restaurants will have great resources for that. You just like print off the chart. I can't remember them and they change sometimes with new yeah. science. So um, cook, cook food to the proper temperature, wash your hands and avoid cross contamination. Cross contamination is when you, um, you, you are cutting chicken on the same board that you then cut lettuce for a salad on. That's yeah. a terrible example, but it's happened before yes. and it's made people sick. And keep in mind that in our industrial food system, 90% of our chicken is infected with salmonella. Like it is. Yeah. And so if you do not practice proper food safety, you're going to make yourself sick. Most people actually make themselves sick and then blame a restaurant for it. They're probably doing a better job than you of keeping their yes. house clean or their restaurant clean and washing their hands. Um, so, you know, just those are the three things. Avoid cross-contamination wash your hands and cook food to the proper temperature. Cool. Um, and think about gravity in terms of cross-contamination. If you store your raw chicken above your lettuce, which is actually how most home um, re uh, refrigerators are designed, which I think is crazy, <laughs> yes. um, you're going to have the potential for those pathogens to drop down into your fresh vegetables that you then, you know, um, prepare uncooked, so. That's super gross. Now I have to think about my fridge as the enemy. Oh, <laughs> your fridge, fridge. Is, is part of the problem yep. yes bad yes fridge. mine has all the produce drawers below where is the only place to store meat yep that's the same in mine i think it's the same in most people's <laughs> they have the produce drawers at the bottom um yeah yeah that's just gross man now i have to think about that every yeah time. and last Thanks. week when i made turkey yeah i was defrosting that turkey breast and it kind of broached its security seal and it dripped down into the produce drawer and i had to throw all of that away no mm -hmm. that's awful it was gross um, yeah, and cross-contamination is something that I think that people in general are really bad at. Um, I always thought people were pretty good at it, but I've grown up working on things where, like, if you touch the material you're working on and then you touch your face, it will burn your skin off. Um, <laughs> and That happens with chilies. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The first time you, you cut, like, jalapenos and then you, like, scratch your nose, you know and you regret it immediately. Um Right. But uh, I was watching somebody with gloves in a store, and I was like, "Good job, man! Like mm -hmm. you're wearing gloves." And this was like right at the beginning of all of all this stuff. And um, I was like, "Yeah, I really have faith in humanity, and we're gonna do all right." Um, and then I saw that same person wearing gloves reach into their pocket, grab their phone, and hold it up to their face with their fingers touching <laughs> their face. And I was like, "Never mind, we're doomed." Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, and I think that, that that is true, that people don't understand how quickly and easily you can cross-contaminate foods and, and everything. I mean, th you have to be Absolutely. constantly vigilant so with true. that stuff. Really, really do. Cleanliness is so important. And mm -hmm. um, anything that you have laying around your kitchen that stays out overnight can be food for bugs and mm -hmm. bugs you know, poop and those poops have pathogens. And so things like that can add up to just like the general cleanliness of your house. Yes. Um, your kitchen. Um, now for, uh, we're also all staying at home and we're eating probably a lot more leftovers. than I think mo most people are used to, and they're actually probably finishing off more of their leftovers than they usually do. Um, how long mm -hmm. can I leave leftovers in the fridge before I'm, you know, going to die? Um, if they've been cooked properly, the general rule or prepared properly is seven days. I think okay. that's a good general rule. Um, but to be honest, you know, it's about spoilage. If it's been held properly and, um, you know, and cooked properly, <laughs> seven, seven days for something like a acidic sauce that you made, that's, that's tough because you throw away something after seven days that could last months. Um, mm -hmm. So it's a little bit about what it is. I think generally things that you've made that are starchy or meaty, 
Uh, seven days is a really good rule, though. And okay. certainly if something smells bad or has mold growing on it, yeah. even if it hasn't right. reached seven days, get rid of it. <laughs> yeah. That's fair. Um, and are there any processes that, like, if I make a big pot of, or, or like, let's say I'm a really new person, I just made, like, this big pot of, uh, like, like, like chicken broth and I want to refrigerate it, um, mm -hmm. do, can I just take it off the stove and throw it in the fridge? Oh, that's a great, that's a really great question. I think most people would think the answer is, yeah, just get it in the fridge as quickly as possible, mm -hmm. but that is not true. So um, the general rule is that you have four hours between when you, you've made something hot until it needs to be cold um, in, in order for you to say that it's been handled properly. Four hours is, is the rule. Uh, okay. But with something like stock, you actually get a little bit more time if you cool it properly so that you don't end up putting it in the fridge and heating up everything else in your fridge to the point where it's now unsafe. <laughs> oh, okay. So that's the um, So, yeah. So the rule is you get six hours, but you've got to keep it um, moving, stir it really frequently, maybe put a fan over it, and um, put some ice cubes in it or something. And in general, in your house, you're not making so much stock that it would take more than an hour, really, to cool it down um, if you use those methods. So ice, stir it, and maybe put a big box fan over it to keep the heat moving off of it. Yeah, cool it down until it's, one. yeah, cool it down until it's room temperature before you put it in the fridge in general. Okay. Very good. And then smaller things can go hot as long as they don't have enough thermal inertia to mess with the rest of your fridge. Right. Like obviously this is a judgment call in, a, in the food service industry. I'm telling you, it is much more rigorous than this. They yes. have to temperature things, take temperatures before they put things in the fridge um, for every little thing. Um, but in your house, yeah, my, my general thinking is if it's really small, I can put it in while it's still warm. But it, like just last night I made rice and it, I was done with it, but it was still really hot. So I let it sit out for an hour to cool before I put it in the fridge. Um, all right. Well, actually that's kind of the end of our list of goodies today. Uh, we've been, on this we covered a lot of ground. We did. Um, is there anything else you would like to tell uh, early college kids about food or any of that? Or do you think we got I it? just would encourage them. This is one of life's greatest pleasures is food and one that um, as Bria Savaron, who I referenced earlier, said lasts long beyond the others that we enjoy <laughs> yes. is our ability to enjoy food. And in today's world, that often means cooking it. So I would encourage people to, to, to play around with this, to become in charge of their own food uh, ingestion through their ability to cook it. I, I think it's a really important skill. Mm -hmm. And one last tip. Um, that's really specific, but it goes back to why restaurant food tastes better. And it's something that you can do yourself without uh, indulging in too much sweet salt or fat to get those um, buttons pushed. You may be fatigued because you cooked the food. You can't smell it anymore, and so you can't taste it. So one thing my husband and I often do when we've cooked, we spend a lot of effort on cooking, is we go outside. <laughs> Or we go to a different part of our house where we can't smell the food as well for like five or ten minutes. And then when we come back, we have like this huge appetite because we can smell the food we just made again. So that's something really easy you can do to make your food taste better. That's a really good idea. I've, I've not really considered doing that. I think of the way our house is set up, it does not really, it's not conducive for having different volumes. But I'm going to have to go try sitting on the porch and then coming back in for a bit. Uh, yeah. Let me know what you think when you, yeah, when you do I'm that. I'm going to. That, that, that's a really good idea. I like that. Um, well, that's great. Well, thank you so much, Cassandra, for joining me this morning. Um, it was a good talk, and hopefully people get something out of this. And honestly, if you if, if anybody has any questions that are more than, than what we've covered here, and you probably will, YouTube and the Internet are just amazing. Um, there is so many resources online, and also one thing that I've, that I've talked to my students before about that I think is really important is that if your grandparents cook something, that you've not had other places, get them to write down the recipe. Mm. Even if it's supposedly mm -hmm. secret or whatever, have them write it down and put it in their will or something. Don't let that stuff go away, um, especially mm -hmm. for, for some of the areas around here, around Montgomery. Like there are, there are food cultures that are very much on the edge of going away. Um, Absolutely. So keep those recipes, even if they are just a record of history, that's totally fine. 
All right. Well, again, thank you so much for joining me. Uh, it's been great. I uh, hope you had a good time. And, thank you. Uh, I did. <laughs> we will, once this is all over, we'll come down and cook together again. Yes, I can't wait. It's one of my favorite things. <laughs> all right. Have a nice day. <laughs> Bye. All right. You too. Bye.